and for the last one and a half years, my health was very bad. I often was only lying in, in my room and couldn't meditate a lot. I was very weak, couldn't go to evening meetings, and I got very depressed because uh, I didn't know how to handle when your body is so weak, so you cannot meditate, and your concentration is also very weak. You, if you read a little bit, and this is just too much. How, how can you practice this uh, when, when, when you, I mean, for a short time it's no problem, but when you're for a long time, you, the body is very weak? Well, when you're like that, then you just use awareness, really. Have metta for it. And you know, just investigate it, you know, there's a, you're still, you know, still can be mindful, and then the, the uh, unpleasant feelings, the pain, the discomfort, and even your emotional reactions to it of not wanting to meditate, you can't do it, things like this. Just use what's ever present to be aware of it in terms of it's like this, not to make it into, you know, a problem, but to just don't make problems around it. Uh, one year I had malaria, you know, and very badly, and I had asked the same question that you just asked to Lumpa Cha. I, said, I can't meditate anymore, I'm just too weak and sick. I mean, at Thomas Hankpeth, I was thinking I was really developing samadhi, and I was really going for a tooth and nail, and face hand, getting it, and then suddenly I can't do anything. And then you've got all these these views about malaria that you've heard, you know, about people dying, going crazy, because I didn't know what to expect. So Ajahn Chah said, well, now your meditation is malaria. And that, keep that in mind, just use what whatever it, you're experiencing, you know, good or bad. With this attitude, it's like this, so you're just kind of accepting it. And be patient with the with the discomforts, of physical or mental, that you're going through. You learn a lot from that, you know. I learned more from that than I uh, did from getting samadhi. Because <laughs> you have to really uh, change your attitude. Where, when I was in the samadhi, Bit. I was, it was me, you know, so based on me trying to get something, you know, trying to get something that I felt I didn't have through reading or what others would tell me. So it was based totally on this illusion of I've got to get some auntie. And then with the, with the malaria, it was more like seeing the, the reactions I had to the fear I had of going crazy with malaria, or the aversion I had to the uh, physical side of it. And so I just started just observing, and I let go of the mental reactions, because I realized I wasn't going to die. And uh, and I was t they gave me some of these chloroquine tablets, you know, to take, in those days they used that. And uh, then, uh, just I realized that the actual, what's like malaria, one day you're feeling quite normal, and then, then you start feeling the oncoming of this fever, it's got, you can pick it up very quickly, and you think, here, here it is, the malaria thing, and then it, it builds up to a crescendo in a few days, and then it, and then it just, ceases and and you like I'd just be soaking wet like it all the water in my body just kind of drenched the, the mat I was under and then you got this feeling of kind of cool relief which is very pleasant you know so all the things about me weren't all that some were pleasant some were weren't but if you're just fighting against malaria out of ignorance then you you may not notice anything other than you don't how can I get rid of it I, I don't want this and, and I had reoccurring fevers for about a year and then it stopped but 
but I learned a lot from that. You know, so I learned how to deal with illness and uh, physical pain and 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 uh, also fears of you know of dying of the unknown and because in America you you know where they you know I never encountered malaria there, but you'd hear stories about GIs coming back from tropical countries and they, for the rest of their lives they were had these malaria attacks and it sounded really awful you know I know I'm, my whole life is going to be I'm going to have this for the rest of my life that kind of perception not true you know it wasn't an obstruction at all and it, it just had to change from this personal striving that I was using a lot to get something that I wanted to more or less accepting the conditions I was experiencing so when you have when you get like that you know, I encourage you to try it out because it'll you learn a lot you know it's not these are not obstructions even though you might personally regard them as such, but that's another view you you, you create yourself. Um, I often I have the problem because uh, my feeling of stamina getting weak, you know, because I'm only lying there, you know, I don't even can go in that body, yeah. even each other, you cannot meditate, you know, I can only read a book, you know, it's not stamina like, and then I feel depressed because, you know, this is not like what someone else is doing, so it's more <coughs> touching thing is coming and so this works together yeah well you also you know uh, some of the life is doesn't mean you can always be good at everything Because in Thailand, they, you know, they say the word gang is applied, you know, oh, he's really gang, and he, he does things very quickly and better than the rest, and you kind of hold that up. And so many of the gang farang monks disrobed. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't last very long. So that's why, why you know, have more confidence in your in your awareness of these things and, you know whatever you're grasping you, you feel you're you're not a very good summoner that's a feeling you create you know so you start looking at it not as just trying to suppress the feeling or believe it but just no it is a perception that comes and goes it's not there all the time but you know you you're attached to an ideal of what you should good summoner should be that's another creation and then you're sick like that and you can't do any of those things that good summoners do and then you have to, people have to come and bring you food and you're only junior monk and things like this then you can feel guilty or worthless but these are all things to observe you know, that which observes is not you know, will help you to see through the illusions you're creating about yourself and your ideals before we were having some fevers at Pujam Gong this year, and uh, we'd heard that there was this dengue fever. We'd heard it was coming up in the hospitals, and uh, a couple of people got it, and it seemed like the symptoms corresponded to that particular pattern of fevers. And then a couple of other people got this other fever, that the symptoms weren't exactly the same, but they were pretty close. And it was really interesting watching the mind kind of like trying to like put it into a box but not being able to. Like almost, it was like, oh, it, it would be almost better if it was dengue fever because then you would know what it was. <laughs> Even though it's a terrible thing that nobody wants, but all of a sudden you're like, but this unknown thing is you just have worse. A name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who makes these names for these humans do? That's dengue fever. That's malaria. But the words don't really matter, it's, you know. And then 
we create a security out of believing in definitions and in words. Like observing yourself how sometimes things don't aren't real unless you have a word for them, or you can define them. You know, so I notice this in myself. So much of life, it's it's moving. It's you know this continuous movement and changing this, and words tend to make something more than what it is. So you know, word just goes by very quickly. This is dengue fever. Or it's not dengue fever. Mm-hmm. And then you you attach to that concept of dengue fever, where actually what you're experiencing is like this, whatever you want to call it, and uh, you don't need a word because you're actually experiencing it. But so many diseases now have no names for them. You know, nobody knows quite what they are. They call them viruses or something because that's a generic term for what we don't know. <laughs> and this is like the human human condition is you know we live in we create this world uh, for, uh, a, a world that we create ourselves and give us a sense of security like I met people who wanted an identity no matter if it was a good one or a bad one so you know, to say I, you know, I'm just a nobody, can be another ego, <laughs> you know. So or alcoholics will will say I'm an alcoholic. Almost, you know, when you first meet them, I'm an alcoholic, and and, and that's an identity, something to uh, define yourself with alcoholism or or uh, whatever, you know, nationality, class sexual orientation, everybody's pinpointing themselves as some kind of, you know, heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual, and then, then you're identified with with race, or class, or ethnic group, and why do we do this, you know, why, why do we have to have a definition? Because we don't know ourselves, so we want even if it's not a very nice, like I'm a nobody or I'm just, I'm just an ordinary guy, is still an identity, and uh, or I'm a hopeless case, or I'm no good. You know, you can the other people talk about themselves like that, or others more like saying, "Well, I'm you know I was first in the class, and I was a, a, a very highly regarded basketball player." And I, <laughs> I'm a film star or a rock singer. <laughs> you got, you got, uh, you know, and, and then like being a famous person or a movie star, or something that gives you, a, you know, an identity of being somebody important. And then we, within the forces, you know, the milieus that we're living in, you know what. You know, what, what, how do you see yourself in the Sangha? What identity do you hold about yourself? But, you know, you're the one that creates these identities. They aren't absolute, fixed identities sent from above. They're, they're what we create in our own minds. Ajahn Chah, the first year I was with him, he said I should reflect on my own virtues and goodness. He could tell that I'm my basic character, it tends to be self-critical. I, I, I was very much aware of weaknesses and faults and negative things about myself, because I thought that's being honest, you know, I'm honest about myself, you know, I've got this problem with this and that, and I have a lot of fears and, and that, but Dr. Cha didn't, I guess he, he could tell that that was my tendency, so he said, think about your goodness. And so I went back to my kuti and I started trying to think my virtues. And I never thought of myself. Here I was 33 years old or so and I never thought of myself as virtuous or good. And actually nothing came up in my mind. <laughs> and then if you asked me, well, what are, what are your faults and weaknesses? I could have given you a long list. <laughs> and I think, why is that? Why do I why do I 
see the just the negative side of me because if I was just a neurotic, hopeless mess with all these faults and weaknesses, why would I be living at Wakbapo, living under Vinaya, keeping in a celibacy? You know, why would I? You know, if I was such a neurotic, screwed up person, why wasn't I back in Berkeley taking all the drugs? This is when the drug scene was wide open. You know, they were having a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could do anything you wanted, and nobody would criticize you for it. Where, you know, in Bapo, very strict, you know, you had to conform, you had to do things according to, and, uh, and boy, boy, I could I could have left and gone to Berkeley and just led an kind of easy life, but I knew that that's what I didn't want. So I think that's, because I really... I began to admit I really love truth, goodness, and beauty. Otherwise, why would I be a monk? Why would I meditate? Why don't I just, you know, I was in a situation where hedonism was encouraged everywhere. Enjoy the world, enjoy the senses, do whatever you feel like, attitudes. Wasn't that I was prohibited from that, just I could see that, that it was a hopeless way to live in the end, you know, I could, I was aware in Berkeley of people that had lived that way for a long time and they were not, they were rather pathetic, you know, as you get older, <laughs> it's a kind of ugly way to have to live your life. 